Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming together to immerse ourselves in the wisdom of Torah, which we inherit and which we contribute to as well. We are in Parshat uh, Matot Masse, which is a double portion. It's the conclusion of the Book of Numbers. It begins in the Book of Numbers with chapter 30, verse 2. We'll read through the English translation of our portion. I'll share with you a little bit of a focus study about it, and then we'll open it up for our collective conversation. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute at this time, together we can recite the blessing, giving thanks for the opportunity of this moment. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Shanu Mitzvotah Vitzivanu Asot Vidivrei Torah Thank you, God, for this opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. <clears throat> so uh, everyone will have an opportunity, if they like to do so, to read a few verses of Torah. Uh, beginning with chapter 30, verse 2. Moses spoke to the heads of the Israelite tribe, saying, This is what Adonai has commanded. The man makes a vow to Adonai, or takes an oath, imposing an obligation on himself. He shall not break his pledge. He must carry out all that has crossed his lips. Number four. Uh, Jerry, would you like to read a little bit at chapter 30, verse 4? I'm in the wrong place. If I'm just passing. Okay, me. sure. Uh, Tony, would you like to read a little bit there, verse 4? If a woman makes a vow to Adonai and assumes an obligation while still in her father's household by reason of her youth, and her father learns of her vow or her self imposed obligation, and offers no objection, all her vows shall stand and every self-imposed obligation shall stand. But if her father restrains her on the day he finds out, none of her vows or self-imposed obligations shall stand and Adonai will forgive her since her father restrained her. If she should marry while her vow or the commitment to which she bound herself is still in force and her husband learns of it, and offers no objection on the day he finds out, her vow shall stand and her self-imposed obligation shall stand. But if her husband restrains her on the day that he learns of it, he thereby annuls her vow, which was in force, or the commitment to which she bound herself, and Adonai will forgive her. The vow of a widow or of a divorced woman, however, whatever she has imposed on herself, shall be binding upon her. So too, if while in her husband's household, he makes a vow or imposes an obligation on herself by oath, and her husband learns of it, yet offers no objection, thus failing to restrain her, all her vows shall stand and all her self-imposed obligations shall stand. But if her husband does annul them on the day he finds out, then nothing that has crossed her lips shall stand, whether vows or self-imposed obligations. Her husband has annulled them and the Lord will forgive her. Every vow and every sworn obligation of self-denial may be upheld by her husband or annulled by her husband. If her husband offers no objection from that day to the next, he has upheld all the vows or obligations she has assumed. He has upheld them by offering no objection on the day he found out. But if he annuls them after the day he finds out, he shall bear her guilt. Those are the laws that Adonai enjoined upon Moses as between a man and his wife, and as between a father and his daughter, while in her father's household by reason of her youth. Thank you. We're now at the start of chapter 31. Kath, do you want to read a little bit? Sure. Thanks, Rabbi. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Avenge the Israelite people on the Midianites, then you shall be gathered to your kin. Moses spoke to the people, saying, Let men be picked out from among you for a campaign, and let them fall upon Midian to wreak the Adonai's vengeance on Midian. You shall dispatch on the campaign a thousand from every one of the tribes of Israel. 
So a thousand from each tribe were furnished from the divisions of Israel, 12,000 picked for the campaign. Moses dispatched them on the campaign, a thousand from each tribe, with Phineas, son of Eleazar, serving as a priest on the campaign, equipped with the sacred utensils and the trumpets for sounding the blasts. They took the field against Midian as Adonai had commanded Moses and slew every male. Along with our other victims, they slew the kings of Midian, Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also put Balaam, son of Beor, to the sword. Thank you so much, Kat. Uh, Sherry, do you want to read now or first nine? Thank you, Daddy. Um, the Israelites took the, took the women and children of the Midianites captive and seized as booty all their, their beasts, all of their herds, and all of their wealth. And they destroyed by fire all the towns which they were settled and their encampments. They gathered all the, the spoil and all of the booty, man and beast, and they brought the captives, the booty and the spoil to Moses, Eleazar the priest, and the whole Israelite community at the camp in the, in, in the steeps of, of Moab at the Jordan near Jericho. Moses, Eleazar the priest, and all the chieftains of the community came out to meet them outside the camp. Moses became angry with the commanders of the army, the officers of thousands, and the officers of hundreds who had come back from the military campaign. Moses said to them, you have spared every female, yet they are, are the very ones who had, at the bidding of Balaam induced the Israelites to trespass against the Lord in the matter of, of Peor, so that the Lord's community was struck by the plague. Now therefore slay every male among the children and slay also every woman who has known a man carnally but spare every young woman who has not been carnal relations with a man. Thank you. Steve, do you want to read a little bit at verse 19? Yeah, I don't understand the last time. You shall then stay outside the camp seven days. Everyone among you or among your captives who has slain a person or touched a corpse to cleanse himself on the third and seventh Days. You shall also cleanse every cloth, every article, the skin, every everything made of goats, and every object of Eleazar the priest said to the troops who had taken part in the fall. This is the ritual law that the Lord has enjoyed upon Moses. Gold and silver, copper, iron and lead, any article that can withstand fire. Views you shall pass through fire and they shall be clean, except they must be cleansed with water and lustration. And anything that cannot withstand fire, you must pass through water. On the seventh day, you shall wash your clothes and be clean, and after that, you may enter the camp. Thank you. Uh, and Robin, would you like to read a little bit starting at verse 25? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Adonai said to Moses, you and Eleazar, the priest, and the family heads of the community, take an inventory of the booty that was captured, human and beast, and divide the booty equally between the combatants who engaged in the campaign and the rest of the community. You shall exact a levy for Adonai. In the case of the warriors who engaged in the campaign, one item in 500 of persons, oxen, asses, and sheep shall be taken from their half share and given to Eleazar the priest as a contribution to Adonai. And from the half share of the other Israelites, you shall withhold one in every 50 human beings, as well as cattle asses and sheep, all the animals, and give them to the Levites who attend to the duties of Adonai's tabernacle. Moses and Eleazar the priest did as Adonai commanded Moses. The amount of booty, other than the spoil that the troops had plundered, came to 675,000 sheep, 72,000 head of cattle, 61,000 asses, 
and a total of 32,000 human beings, namely the females who had not had carnal relations. Thus, the half share of those who had engaged in the campaign was as follows. The number of sheep was 337,500. Nadonai's levy from the sheep was 675. The cattle came to 36,000, from which Nadonai's levy was 72. The asses came to 30,500, from which Nadonai's levy was 61. And the number of human beings was 16,000, from which Adonai's levy was 32. Moses gave the contributions levied for Adonai to Eleazar the priest, as Adonai had commanded Moses. Thank you so much. Uh, Mark Thompson, want to read a little bit at verse 42? Sure, thank you. As for the half share of the other Israelites, which Moses withdrew from the men who had taken the field, that half share of the community consisted of 337 thousand five hundred sheep, thirty six thousand head of cattle, thirty thousand five hundred asses, and sixteen thousand human beings. From this half share of the Israelites, Moses withheld one in every fifty humans and animals, and he gave them to the Levites, who attended to the duties of the Lord's tabernacle, as the Lord had commanded Moses. The commanders of the troop divisions, the officers of thousands and the officers of hundreds, approached Moses. They said to Moses, your servants have made a check of the warriors in our charge, and not one of us is missing. So we have brought as an offering to the Lord such articles of gold as each of us came upon, armlets, bracelets, signets, rings, earrings, and pendants, that expiation may be made for our persons before Adonai. Moses and Eliezer, the priest, accepted the gold from them, all kinds of broad articles, all the gold that was offered by the officers of thousands and the officers of hundreds, as a contribution to Adonai came to 16,750 shekels, but in the ranks, everyone kept his booty for himself. So Moses and Eliezer, the priest, accepted the gold from the officers of thousands and the officers of hundreds and brought it to the tent of meeting as a reminder in behalf of the Israelites before Adonai. Thank you. We are now on Chapter 32. Dave Lebb, would you like to read starting there? Oh, I'd be honored. The uh, Reubenites and the Gadites owned uh, cattle in very great numbers, uh, noting that the lands of Jazar and Gilead were regions suitable for cattle. The uh, Gadite and Reubenite leaders came to Moses. Eliezer the priest and the chieftains of the community and said, Ataroth, Doban, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Eliyah, Sibon, Nebo, and Beon, the land that Adonai has conquered for the community of Israel is cattle country, and uh, your servants have cattle. It would be a favor to us, they continued, if this land were given to your servants as a holding, uh, do not move us across the Jordan. <clears throat> Moses replied to the Gadites and the Reubenites, are your brothers to go to war with you while you stay here? Why will you turn the minds of the Israelites from crossing into the land that Adonai has given them? That is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to survey the land. After going up to the Wadi Eskol and surveying the land, they turned the minds of the Israelites from invading the land that Adonai has given them. Thereupon Adonai was incensed and swore. None of the men from 20 years up who came out of Egypt shall see the land that I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for they did not remain loyal to me. None except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and the Kezanite and Joshua, son of Nun, for they remained loyal to Adonai. Adonai, incensed at Israel, made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years while the whole generation that had provoked Adonai's displeasure was gone. And now you, as a breed of sinful followers, have replaced your fathers to add still further to Adonai's wrath against Israel. If you turn away from God, 
who then abandons them once more in the wilderness, you will bring uh, calamity upon all the people. Thank you so much. Mark Levenstein, would you like to read a little bit, starting at verse 16? Yes, please. <clears throat> then they stepped up to him and said, we will build here sheepfolds for our flocks and towns for our children. And we will hasten as shock troops in the van of the Israelites until we have established them in their home, while our children stay in the fortified towns because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until every one of the Israelites is in possession of his portion. We will not have a share with them in the territory beyond the Jordan, where we received our share on the east side of the Jordan. <clears throat> Moses said to them, if you do this, if you go to battle as shock troops at the instance of the Lord, and every shock fighter among you crosses the Jordan at the instance of the Lord, he has dispossessed his enemies before him, and the land has been subdued at the instance of the Lord, and then you return, you shall be clear before the Lord and before Israel. And this land shall be your holding under the Lord. But if you do not do so, you will have sinned against the Lord, and know that your sin will overtake you. Build towns for your children and sheepfolds for your flock. But do what you have promised. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, and then, Paul, would you like to read starting at verse 25? Uh, thank you, Rabbi. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben said to Moses, saying, Your servants shall do as my Lord commands. Our small children, our wives, our livestock, and all our animals will be there in the cities of the Gilead. And your servants shall cross over every armed person of the legion before Hashem to do the battle, as my Lord speaks. Concerning them, Moses commanded Elias of the Kohen, Joshua son of Nun, the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. Moses said to them, if the children of God and the children of Reuben will cross the Jordan with you, everyone armed for battle before Hashem, and the, land, and the Lord and the land is conquered before you, you shall give them the land of Gilead as a heritage. But if they do not cross over armed with you, then they will take their heritage among you in the land of Canaan. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke up, saying, As Hashem has spoken to your servants, so shall we do. We shall cross over on before Hashem to the land of Canaan, and ours shall be the heritage of our inheritance across the Jordan. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, David Phillips, you want to read a little bit, verse 33? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. And Moses gave them, the children of God and the children of Reuben, and half of the tribe of Manasseh, son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan. The land with its cities, with the borders of the land and cities all around. And the children of God built Dibon and Ataroth and Aroer, and Taroth Shofan and Yazer and Yogbeha and Beth Nimrah and Beth Haran, fortified cities and fences for flocks. And the children of Reuben built Heshbon and Elieleh and Kiriathaim and Nebo and Baal Meron with changes of name and Sibma. And they called the names of the cities that they built by new names. And the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and captured it and dispossessed the Amorite who was in it. And Moses gave Gilead to Machir, son of Manasseh, and they lived in it. And Yair, son of Manasseh, went and captured their villages, and he called them Havoth Yair. And Noba went and captured Kanath and its towns, and he called it Noba after his own name. Thank you. Now we're going to continue with uh, the second half of our portion, Masse, at the beginning of chapter 23. Robert, would you like to read a little bit at the very start there? Yes, thank you. These are the journeys of the children of Israel, which went forth out of the land of Egypt with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. 
and Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. And they departed from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with an eye hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them. Upon their gods also the Lord executed judgments. And the children of Israel moved from Ramesses and pitched in Sukkoth. And they departed from Sukkoth and pitched in Itham, which is in the edge of the wilderness. And they removed from Etham and turned again unto Peharoth, which is before Baal-Zephon, and they pitched before Megal. And they departed from before Peharoth and passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness and went three days journey into the wilderness of Etham and pitched in Marah. And they removed from Marah and came unto Elim. And in Elim were 12 fountains of water and three score and 10 palm trees. And they pitched there. And they removed from Elam and encamped by the Red Sea. And they removed from the Red Sea and encamped in the wilderness of Sin. And they took their journey out of the wilderness of Sin and encamped in Dabkot. And they departed from Dabka and encamped in an Alush. And they removed from Alush and encamped in Repidim, where was no water for the people to drink. And they departed from Repidim and pitched in the wilderness of Sinai. And they removed from the desert of Sinai and pitched in Kib Kibratava. And they departed from Kibratava and encamped in Hazaroth. And they departed from Hazaroth and pitched in Rithma, and they departed from Rithma and pitched in Rimon Perez. And they departed from Rimon Perez and pitched in Libna, and they removed from Libna and pitched in Risa. And they journeyed from Risa and pitched in Kehalatha, and they departed from Kehalatha and pitched in Mount Shapir. And they removed from Mount Shapir and encamped in Herada, and they removed from Herada and pitched in Makaloth. And they removed from Makaloth and encamped in Tahath. And they removed from Ta uh, yes, and they departed from Tahath and pitched in Terah, and they removed from Terah and pitched in Mithka. And they went from Mithka and pitched in Hashmana, and they departed from Hashmana and encamped in Maseroth. And they departed from Maseroth and pitched in Benajakan, and they removed from Benajakan and encamped in Horhagadad. And they went on from Horhagadad and pitched in Jatbatha, and they removed from Jatbaha and encamped in Ebrana. And they departed from Ebrana and encamped in Ezion Geber, and they removed from Ezion Geber and pitched in the wilderness of Zin, which is Kadesh. And they removed from Kadesh and pitched in Mount Or and in the edge of the land of Edorn. Thank you so much, Robert. You've taken us on quite a journey. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize for the pronunciations. Please was, forgive me. It was exquisite. Thank you. All right. Uh, and uh, Tom and Jackie, would you like to read a little bit? It's only verse 38. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, Jackie's lost her voice, so I will be <laughs> sacrificing an unblemished goat after this session. Uh, Aaron the priest ascended Mount Hor at the command of the Eternal and died there. In the 40th year after the Israelites had left the land of Egypt, on the first day of the fifth month, Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. And the Canaanite king of Arab, who dwelt in Negev, in the land of Canaan, learned of the coming of the Israelites. They set out from Mount Hor and camped in Zalmanah. 
Then they set out from Zalana and encamped in Punan. Then they set out from Punan and encamped in Oboth. Then they set out in Oboth and encamped in Ayr Arabim in the territory of Moab. Then they set out for Aim and encamped in Didon Gad. Then they set out from Didon Gab and encamped in Alman Did Balahim. They set out from Alman Bedahim and encamped in the hills of Abarim. Uh, before Nebo, they set out from the hills of Abarim and encamped in the steppes of Moab at the Jordan near Jericho. Then they encamped at the Jordan near Beth Jismanoth, as far as Abel Shittim in the steppes of Moab. In the steppes of Moab at the Jordan near the Jericho, the Eternal One spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, When you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, you shall dispose of all inhabitants of the land. You shall destroy all their figured objects. You shall destroy all their molten images and you shall demolish all their cult places. And you shall take possession of the land and settle in it. For I have assigned the land to you to possess. You shall apportion the land among yourselves by lot, by clan, with larger groups increasing the share and smaller groups reduce the share. Whether the lots fall, whether the lot falls for it, it shall be the, its location. You shall have your portions according to the ancestral tribes. But if you not dispossess the inhabitants of the land, those on whom who allow them to remain shall be strings in the eyes and thorns in your side, and they shall harass you in the land in which you live. <clears throat> So that I will not do to you what I plan to do to them. Okay, thank you so much. And, and Marty, would you like to read a little bit at the very start, of chapter thirty-four? Um, yes, Rabbi. Thank you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, "Instruct the Israelite people and say to them: When you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land that you shall shall fall to you as your portion, the land of Canaan with its various boundaries." Your southern sector shall extend from the wilderness of Zin along side Edom. Your southern boundary shall start on the east from the tip of the Dead Sea. Your boundary shall then turn to pass south of the ascent of um, Akrabim and continue to Zin. And its limits shall be south of Kadesh Barnea, reaching Hazar Adar and continuing to um, Asmon. And from Asmon, the boundary shall turn towards the Wadi of Egypt and terminate at the sea. For the Western boundary, you shall have the coast of the great sea that shall serve as your Western boundary. This shall be your Northern boundary. Draw a line from the great sea to Mount Hor, from Mount Hor, draw a line to Libo Hamath and let the boundary reach Zedad. The boundary shall then run to Zephon and terminate at Hazar Ina. That shall be your northern boundary. For your eastern boundary you shall draw a line from Hazar Inan to Sephon. From, from the Sephon, the boundary shall descend to Ribla on the east side of uh, Ainin. From there, the boundary shall continue downward and abut on the eastern slopes of the Sea of Shinaref. The boundary shall then descend along the Jordan and terminate at the Dead Sea. That shall be your land as defined by its boundaries on all sides. Thank you so much, Marty. Uh, Michael, would you like to read a little bit starting at verse 13 of chapter 34? Uh, <clears throat> Moses commanded the children of Israel saying, this is the land that you shall divide as an inheritance by lot, which Hashem has commanded to give to the nine and a half tribes. For the tribe of the children of Reuben have taken according to their father's house and the tribe of the children of God according to their father's house and half the tribe of Manasseh have uh, taken their inheritance. Two and a half tribes have taken their inheritance on the bank of the Jordan by Jericho eastward toward the sunrise. Hashem spoke to Moses saying, these are the names of the men who are to take possession of the land for you. Elazar the Kohen, Joshua the son of Nun, and one leader from each tribe shall you take to possess the land. These are the names of the men for the tribe of Judah, Caleb son of Je 
Jephune, Jephuna, uh, and for the tribe of children of Simeon, Sem, Se, Sh, uh, Shmuel, uh, so, Shmuel, son of um, Mehud, uh, for the tribe of Benjamin, Elidad, son of Chislon, and uh, I guess that's Chislon, and for the tribe of the children of Don as leader, Puki, son of Jagli, for the children, for the children of Joseph, for the tribe of the children of Manasseh as leader, Haniel, son of Ephodi, and for the tribe of the children of Ephraim as leader, Kebuel, son of Shiftan, and for the tribe of the children of Zebulun as, le as leader, Elizaphan, son of Parnach, and for the tribe of the children of Issachar as leader, Paltiel, son of Azan, and for the tribe of the children of Asher, as leader Ahihud, Ahihud, son of Shalomi, and for the tribe of the children of Naphtali, as leader Pedahel, son of Amihud. These are the ones whom Hashem commanded to apportion to the children of Israel the land of Canaan. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, Catherine, would you like to read a little bit at the very start of chapter 35? Thank you, Rabbi. The Lord spoke to, to Moses in the steps of Moab at the Jordan near Jericho, saying, instruct the Israelite people to assign out of the buildings a portion to them, towns for the Levites to dwell in. You shall also assign to the Levites pasture land around their towns. The town shall be theirs to dwell in and the pasture shall be for the cattle they own and all their other beasts. The, the town pasture that you are to assign to the Levites shall extend a thousand cubits outside the town wall all around. You shall measure off 2,000 cubits outside the town on, on the east side 2,000 on the south side, 2,000 on the west side, and 2,000 on the north side. Be the pasture for those, for, for their towns. The, the towns that you assign to the Levites shall comprise the six cities of refuge that you are to designate for, for a manslayer to flee to, to which you shall add 42 towns. Thus the total of the towns that you assign to the Levites shall be 48 towns with, with, their, with their pasture. In Assigning towns from the buildings of the Israelites take more from the larger groups and less from the smaller so that each assign towns to the Levites to proportion in proportion to the share of it receives. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, and uh... Justin, there you are. Could you, would you like to read at the start of verse nine? Thank you, Rabbi. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you cross the Jordan to the land of Canaan, you shall designate cities for yourselves. There shall be cities of refuge for you and a murderer who killed a person unintentionally shall flee there. These cities shall serve you as a refuge from an avenger so that the murderer shall not die until he stands in judgment before the congregation. The cities that you provide shall serve as six cities of refuge for you. You shall provide the three cities in Transjordan and the three cities in the land of Canaan, they shall be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be a refuge for the children of Israel and for the proselyte and resident among them 
so that anyone who unintentionally kills a person can flee there. If he struck them with an iron instrument and he dies, he is a murderer and the murderer shall be put to death. If he struck him with a fist-sized stone, which is deadly, and he dies, he's a murderer, and the murderer shall be put to death. Or with a fist-sized wooden instrument, which is deadly, and he dies, he's a murderer, and the murderer shall be put to death. The blood avenger shall kill the murderer, and he may kill him when he meets him. If, out of hatred, he pushed him or threw something at him with premeditation and he died, or if he maliciously struck him with his hand and he died, the assailant shall be put to death. If he is a murderer, the blood avenger may kill the murderer when he meets him. But if he pushed him accidentally, without malice, or threw an object at him without premeditation, or with any stone which is deadly, and without seeing his victim, he threw it down at him and killed him, but he was not his enemy and bore no malice, then the congregation shall judge between the assailant and the blood avenger on the basis of these judgments. The congregation shall protect the murderer from the hand of the blood avenger, and the congregation shall return him to the city of refuge to which he had fled, and he shall remain there until the Kohen Gadol, who anointed him with sacred oil, dies. But if the murderer goes beyond the border of the city of refuge to which he had fled, and the blood avenger finds him outside the limits of his city of refuge, and the blood avenger slays the murderer, he has no blood. For he shall remain in his city of refuge until the Kohen Gadol dies. And only after the Kohen Gadol has died, may the murderer return to the land which is his possession. The, these shall be for you a statute of justice for all your generations in all your dwelling places. Whoever, namely the blood avenger, kills a person based on the testimony of witnesses, he shall slay the murderer. A single witness may not testify against a person so that he should die. You shall not accept ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, for he shall be put to death. You shall not accept ransom for one who has fled the city of refuge to allow him to return to live in the land before the Kohen has died. And you shall not corrupt the land in which you live, for the blood corrupts the land. The blood which is shed in the land cannot be atoned for except through the blood of the one who shed it. And you shall not defile the land where you reside, in which I dwell. For, I'm the, for I am the Lord who dwells among the children of Israel. Thank you. Now on chapter 36. The family heads in the clan of the descendants of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, one of the Josephite clans came forward and appealed to Moses and the chieftains, family heads of the Israelites. They said, Adonai commanded my Lord to assign the land to the Israelites as shares by lot. And my Lord was further commanded by Adonai to assign the share of our kinsman, Salofchad, to his daughters. Now, if they marry persons from another Israelite tribe, their share will be cut off from our ancestral portion and be added to the portion of the tribe into which they marry. Thus, our allotted portion will be diminished. And even when the Israelites observe the Jubilee, their share will be added to that of the tribe into which they marry, and their share will be cut off from, their, from the ancestral portion of our tribe. So Moses, at Adonai's bidding, instructed the Israelites, saying, the plea of the Josephite tribe is just. This is what Adonai has commanded concerning the daughters of Zelophehad. They may marry anyone they wish, provided they marry into a clan of their father's tribe. No inheritance of the Israelites may pass over from one tribe to another, but the Israelites must remain bound each to the ancestral portion of his tribe. Every daughter among the Israelite tribes who inherits a share must marry someone from a clan of her father's tribe 
in order that every Israelite may keep his ancestral, ancestral share. Thus, no inheritance shall pass over from one tribe to another, but the Israelite tribe shall remain bound each to its portion. The daughters of Lochah did as Adonai had commanded Moses. Bala, Tirza, Ogla, Yoka, and Noah, the Lofahad's daughters were married to sons of their uncles, marrying into clans of descendants of Manasseh, son of Joseph. And so their share remained in the tribe of their father's clan. These are the commandments and regulations that Anai enjoined upon the Israelites through Moses on the steps of Moab at the Jordan near Jericho. That includes not only our Torah portion for the week, it also includes a Sefer Midbar, the book of Numbers, we have a special prayer that we recite at the conclusion of it. If you'd like to unmute together, we can recite Hazak, 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 Be strong, be strong, and we shall be strengthened. I'd like to share with you a little bit of a focus study, and, and then we'll have our collective uh, conversation. Uh, if anyone needs uh, here, I have two extra copies here if you need that. So with this double portion of Matot say, we literally come to the very edge of the journey. It's the edge of the journey, both in terms of the narrative form, in terms of a, a literary structure, and geographically uh, as well, they're on the edge. And it, it comes to, uh, it's on the edge in terms of a, a literary structure because with the book of Numbers, we really are going to be leaving behind narrative form. When we go into the book of Deuteronomy, it's going to primarily be uh, a speech uh, by Moses, who's going to be uh, reflecting on and recapitulating everything that has happened uh, up until this moment in their journey. And so we are in a sense are bidding goodbye to the, the dynamic that is narrative, the, the give and take, the many voices that we've heard, the many different personalities that, we, that we've encountered along the way. And it's also uh, on the edge in terms of where they are in the geography. They are at the very edge of crossing over into the, the promised land. They are there uh, on the heights of Moab. They're getting ready to cross over uh, the Jordan River. And this is a, a journey of crossing over that began generations and generations and generations ago, from the very moment when Abraham was first called Chayvrit, the one who crosses over. And so this is this is the climax of that journey that in a sense began when Abraham himself crossed over from one land uh, to another. And of course, for the Israelites who are there at this moment, they are on the edge. This is the moment. Are they going to go? Are they going to stay? Are they going to embrace this possibility? Or are they going to do what their ancestors did 38 years ago and say, we'd rather not? So this moment of being on the edge in so many different ways creates this a bit of tension on many different levels. And the question is, how will uh, the body of the Torah, uh, the characters within it, uh, the, the, the storyline itself, how will it respond to being on the edge here? So there's a, there's a fascinating way in which the concluding portions that we've just read of the book of Numbers echo the opening portions of the book of Numbers. And so if you have a study sheet, I invite you to, to take it out. And you see here in number one, I have verses from the opening of the book of Numbers and verses from the, ver the portions that we've just read, the concluding portions of the book of Numbers. So we've just read in chapter 30, verse two, that Moses spoke to the heads of the Israelite tribes, the Matot. And of course, this is where we get the name for the first portion that we read tonight, Matot. And that word Matot, which is in the plural, 
is a word that we encounter at the very opening of the book of Numbers, and that's from chapter one, verse four. Associate with you shall be a man from each tribe. So if you remember, the whole book of Numbers opens up with all of the tribes arrayed around the Mishkan, every tribe under its own banner, its own standard, everything was organized. So it, this, this, this uh, evocation of the opening up of the book of Numbers where everything seemed like it was getting well organized, it was being orderly, that everyone was gonna have a place around the table, so to speak, or surrounding the Mishkan. So that gives us a sense of hope that there will be this, this similar kind of, of order and everyone has a place and everything will move forward uh, with some kind of purpose and decorum. And similarly, our uh, word masse, which opens up the second half of this week's Torah portion is from chapter 33, verse one. These were the marches masse of the Israelites. And that word masse is also evocative of what we encountered in the opening up of the book of Numbers, where it's used in the its verb form. And so they marched, nasa'u, each with his clan. So both matot and masse have key words that evoke these moments of the opening up of the book of Numbers, where, where there was a sense of purpose, organization, hopefulness, and perhaps, perhaps we're able to grab back uh, 38 years worth uh, and embrace this, this moment of anxiety, being on the edge and say there's hopefulness as we're getting ready to, to cross over. That the past is being repurposed as a way to, to inspire us and sustain us in this new and unknown moment of crossing over at the point of being on the edge. And then something happens that causes us to, to recognize that in every moment of being on the edge, there's also danger as well as the hopefulness of new possibilities. And that involves this encounter between this confrontation between the tribes of Gad and Reuben and Moses. And the tribes of, of Gan, uh, Gad and Reuben uh, say to Moses, uh, don't, ca don't cause us to cross over the Jordan. And immediately Moses responds by saying, are your brothers to go to war while you stay here? Why will you turn the minds of the Israelites from crossing over into the land that God has given them? That's exactly what your ancestors did. When I sent them from Kadesh Barnea, to survey the land. So Moses hears the, either the statement, the plea, the request, or the offer perhaps from the tribes of Gad and Reuben to say, um, this, is a, this is a good place for us. You don't need to call us to, to cross over. He hears that as an abandonment of the other tribes as they get ready to cross over and confront whatever enemies um, may be on the other side. And he calls up that incident at Kardesh Barnea when the scouts were sent over to scout out the land because they were once on the edge before. And the scouts came back from their exploration of the promised land and it all is a beautiful place. It's very fertile, there's all this wonderful fruit but we'll never be able to occupy it. The people there are too great. We were like grasshoppers. Uh, we must have seemed like grasshoppers in their eyes. And so that, that abandonment of the mission at that point is what caused another 38 years of, of wandering in the wilderness. And so Moses immediately jumps to the conclusion that you're doing the same thing that your ancestors did 38 years ago. And there's a lot of commentary that criticizes Moses for jumping to some conclusions by drawing some assumptions that, that this commentary doesn't think was really justified. And basically most of the commentary says, look, 
maybe the tribes of Gad and Reuben weren't as clear about what they meant uh, as they could have been, but they, they didn't intend to just abandon uh, the, the other tribes. They were just basically saying, uh, you, you, we don't need uh, to live on the other side because this place is good for cattle, but of course we'll help you settle the other side. And so here's what the medieval commentator Nachmanides said, number uh, four. The explanation is that they said to Moses, you don't have to give us an inheritance along with those who settle on the Western side, thereby making their inheritance smaller for an inheritance which is suitable for us has come to us since it is a land fit for cattle and we have more cattle than other tribes. This they said in the nature of a request, not by way of contention. Let's continue this. And this is also another, uh, this is from Abravna who lived about uh, 1500, uh, first in Spain and, and then in Italy. Well, they confused Moses. By their speech, they led him to assume that they feared the battle ahead and were seeking a way to avoid helping conquer the land. They should have said, we are ready to join in conquering the land and we'll be satisfied if you allow us to inherit this land east of the Jordan. And then Akedat Yitzhak, which is a collection of commentary uh, by the medieval commentator Isaac ben Moses Arama, who lived uh, about 1475, uh, also first in Spain, then Italy. Moses should have apologized for his hasty false assumptions. Their error was not in their motives, but in their lack of clarity about their goals they were incapable of articulating a clear direction. So here again, they're, they're, these commentators are all saying, really the worst that uh, Gad and Reuben did was not speak very clearly. They had really meant all along to help the, their fellow tribes uh, get settled in the land. And they just merely said, none of that land in Canaan needs to, to be divided up for our purposes because on the east side of the Jordan River is much better land for our cattle. So please uh, divide up the, the land uh, on, the east, on the west side uh, without any need to take us into consideration. So here we are at this moment of being on the edge of entering into the unknown, something new, leaving behind narrative, leaving behind where they've been journeying for 40 years now, uh, leaving behind the journey itself and finally getting to what seems to be the climax of the story and of their journey. And several things are happening. One, the text itself, by bringing in hints from the opening up of the Book of Numbers is indicating there's something from the past that can sustain you when you enter into the unknown future. But here, this incident with Gad and Reuben and Moses is also indicating, be careful that you don't merely reflexively reach back into the past in order to understand and react to something in the present. Don't replay old tapes when, new, when something new is needed. And we've seen Moses do this uh, recently uh, when he uh, hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock when he was incapable of grasping some new way of, of transmitting land that the daughters of Zalochachad offered up. And so here again, he immediately reaches back into a past incident and assumes that that's what's happening in the present. And I was studying the, the Torah portion this week, I stumbled upon an article which most people that uh, are studying with me tonight will understand far better than I did because it's an article that was in Scientific American uh, by a scientist named Evelyn Lamb. <clears throat> and the article's entirely what T.S. Eliot told me about the chain rule. Now, those of you who are scientists and mathematicians and um, who did far better than I did at calculus, one of my worst subjects, uh, will know will understand what the chain rule is. The chain rule in calculus has to do with 
how to uh, find the derivative of a composite function. So the article is basically about how uh, she is trying to work through uh, a proof uh, that uh, a math professor is teaching her and she's very dissatisfied with it. And she says, I've got a much better proof uh, that, that will solve this problem. And she works it through and, and then she realizes that actually the professors, uh, even though it was more complicated, was a better proof than the one she was relying upon. And she realizes that it's because she liked hers uh, and she, she liked hers and it was something that was familiar to her. And so she wrote this in this conclusion, she wrote, theorems are easier to prove when you assume they're true in the first place. Our tendency to be predisposed to, to using that as a source of proof, that which we think is true, uh, precludes other possibilities. And that's what happened to her when she was engaged in this, in this math problem. And what, why did she bring in T.S. Eliot? Because T.S. Eliot wrote this profound poem a little getting that's part of a much larger work called Four Quartets. And in that poem, T.S. Eliot is, is exploring in the context of terrible damage and, and death and destructions that's happened as a result of German aerial bombings of England. He's contemplating um, death and the possibility of what happens after death. He's contemplating Oh, uh, if you will, uh, endings, beginnings. He uses imagery about fire, both for its destructive purpose, uh, as well as its uh, purgation purpose, as well as for its redemptive and reconstructive purpose. <clears throat> and he has this, these four lines that appear in his poem, Little Gidding. <clears throat> we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. This is what this journey that we've been reading about is all about, isn't it? I mean, this is where it all started in the land of Canaan. And now they have been up, they were uprooted from it. They were exiled from it. And now they're journeying back to it. Is it familiar? Is it gonna be different? Are they going to be different? And this is what T.S. Eliot, I think, is hinting at, is that when you go on the journey properly, where you end up is where you started, but it's never the same, and neither are you. If you turn over uh, this painting by Jean Dubuffet, the French artist, and uh, Dubuffet didn't really start painting until uh, he was about 40 some years old. And he painted as T.S. Eliot wrote his poetry in the context of World War II and the madness and destruction and the death. To be fair, he too was, became a painter during uh, World War II. And, and he embraced a form of art um, that was a rejection of prescribed standards of beauty and said, at this moment in time, it's important to just jettison uh, all those accepted standards of beauty, that you need to look for, for beauty in the margins of, of life. You, and he, he went and visited uh, psychiatric uh, institutions he went and visited primitive societies. And it's there he found some kind of redemptive quality. And he incorporated into his works of art uh, materials that were coarse and rough from everyday life, sand and gravel and, and peels from fruit and he would incorporate them in his works. And here we have a painting called The Misunderstanding because that's what's happening with Gad and Reuben and Moses. They are speaking past one another. Gad and Reuben, the tribes, are speaking to Moses about the future, about new possibilities and innovation. We don't need to cross over there 
and settle in the land of Canaan, although that's been the plan all along. We can settle here, east of the Jordan River. And Moses, when he hears that, rather than contemplating new possibilities and a new way of doing things, of being innovative, is stuck too much in the past and responds to them as if they are reenacting some kind of treachery from the past. So uh, this, this notion of the misunderstanding, which on the canvas, you see all these faces, but none of them are really attentive to one another. They're looking past one another. And I think that is the, the tragedy that we face, uh, experienced uh, in the mid 20th century. The incapacity of human beings to gaze upon one another uh, and see how important uh, one another was in order to sustain life and cross over into a better future. So with that, uh, I'd like to love to open it up if people are willing to stay for five, six, seven extra minutes because we have this long double portion. So we can uh, share what you saw or what you thought and what you reflected upon in the course of this week's uh, Torah portion. If you'd like to raise your hand, I'd love to call upon you. Uh, Robert and then Mark Thompson. You know what I love about art like this and Picasso and so many others that I, you know, I don't know all their names, but art that to my mind says the artists are seeking. It's a new time, a new age. They're searching. They're searching for something more. They're not sure where it is. That's what I love about these. And for me, that's what I see in this. In addition to the obvious, which you pointed out. And thank you. Thank you, yeah. They're, they're pushing boundaries, perhaps crossing over boundaries. And in doing so, they return back from that journey to share something that they've experienced with us. Thank you so much, Robert. And Mark Thompson, and then Paul. Um, first of all, I'm not gonna ask you what a composite function is. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do wanna uh, pursue the subject of uh, tribes. And it occurred to me as we uh, read this portion that we don't really discuss the tribe so much in current times. What we seem, as, at least as Reformed Jews, to talk about is perhaps the differences that we have between ourselves and um, the Orthodox community. And it occurs to me that sometimes, from my perspective, they are stuck in the past. Uh, we're more like the Reubenites and the Gadites uh, wanting to try something new. And I think it's a conflict that uh, persists to this day. Uh, and then you've got the conservative branch of Judaism that tries to play, bo play both ends. So uh, I think it's interesting. And, and I know that um, it, it's not something that's going to be resolved easily soon. Uh, but I was curious to know why you think it is that the tribes really aren't discussed any longer. I, I have a friend who happens to be Mormon. And for him, the tribes are extremely important because the Mormons believe themselves to be um, to be answer, to be uh, followers, uh, actually the, part of the house of Israel through the tribe of Ephraim. And so it's very important for them to establish their own identity. But as Jews, um, you know, it was apparently important for them to stay within their own tribe. But we no longer have these identifications. The only thing we really have are, are we a Cohen or a Levi? And I'm just curious to know why. The, the tribal identifications have disappeared. Well, the tribes disappeared, right? The, we, the 10 lost tribes of Israel, when the Assyrians uh, defeated us and, and the 10 tribes were, were scattered and lost. And, and so the links to those identities were, were probably lost as well. So what we what are left are basically as identities uh, have an, it, to have be an Israelite, all, except for those who are able to link their heritage to, to either a, a Kohen or, or a Levite. Uh, and, and, and so that, that's where we are. And I do wanna say one thing about uh, the notion of denominations, of course, is a very modern notion. I mean, that, that's, that's a post-Enlightenment notion. Uh, prior to that, 
the notion of reform, orthodox, conservative, didn't even exist. Those terms didn't exist. So that's a very modern conception that's at the most 200 years old out of this, you know, 3,000 years of history. But what you, what you did remark upon is that within Judaism, there is this constant tension between tradition and innovation, which we're seeing played out in this week's portion, if we will. And there's always this tension between fidelity to values that have sustained us and we carry with us and an agility to adapt to exigent circumstances in the moment. And that's the glorious dance that happens within the Talmud, if you will. Mm. Uh, this adherence to, to what has been, we've carried with us for thousands of years and then facing current day circumstances and, and how do they interplay. So thank you very much for raising those, those key issues. Okay. Uh, Paul. Yeah. Uh... Well, Moses was confused because he was presented with a bunch of sentences and he got confused. I'm a little simpler and uh, I know Hebrew is an old language, but my Hebrew is even older. And so uh, when you said the word matot, and I really accept that tribes fits that, that explanation better than what I'm thinking because the moment you said that, how many weekends have gone by in my life where I say, mechaye hameitim? Oh. So we're talking about the lives of the dead men or the dead people. So I'm looking at how my coat is dead ladies. So, you know, <laughs> how, do, how, do, so how do you get the tribes out of that? Yeah. So I know you always concentrate on words, but that, I, I mean, I just couldn't get past that. We started reading by, I kept going back to the first line. That's lovely. So uh, as a hearer, uh, that's, you're hearing something that's different than if you were seeing the, the, the different the Hebrew words in writing. But that's lovely because uh, primarily for you know a long period of time we were a, an oral tradition. Uh, these were stories that were told. So who knows? Maybe someone else had the same reaction that you did, say two thousand years ago. They heard this. Oh my God! All, all those dead women. What's what's this all about? The heads of the dead ladies. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Paul. For oh, reminding okay. us, reminding us about the the beautiful complexity of the language. Thank you. Uh, David and Susan, and then Tom and Jackie. So in listening to the quandary that Moses had about the tribes, th assuming that the tribes were not gonna cross over the river Jordan and fight with the rest of the community. So then it came to mind, well then, Whose responsibility is it? Is it more the responsibility of the person that's communicating or the person that's listening to invest, to make sure that they understand what the other one is saying? And I I'm, I'm came to the conclusion it was really both, that we both have, both the listener and the speaker have the responsibility to make sure that they're clear and that the other person understands what they're saying. Right. But then it occurred to me that in a way, so much of the Torah is very possibly about this lack of communication. You know, when, when they made the golden calf, they didn't know what Moses was doing up on the mountain for all that time. And there's so many times, it seems like, if you go back through the Torah that we've read, that perhaps communication might have resolved a lot of the issues. Yeah. So it reminds me of that moment way back in Exodus when Moses first comes to speak to the Israelites and, and uh, it, his first speech with them doesn't work and Moses cries out to God, they would not listen to me, so how can I speak? So, <laughs> so there, he's, he's drawing this dynamic that it's not so much that speakers create hearers, but hearers create speakers. And, and that relationship between hearing and speaking with that, that you're pointing out. So thank you for that. David, did you want to share something? Um, or maybe explain to us about composite functions. <laughs> Jeez. <clears throat> I don't remember composite functions. <clears throat> and Rabbi, calculus was my worst subject. <laughs> <laughs> but I powered through. I called my dad after I flunked the 
the midterm of my second semester of calculus, my dad being an engineer, and said, Dad, you're an engineer too. You've been an engineer for 30 years. Do you ever use calculus? When was the last time you used calculus? And he said, I think it's when I got my master's at SC. So he never used it. That really motivated me to work harder. <laughs> 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 Actually, I've been I've been chatting with Mark, explaining to him what it really is, and those definitions are a sandwich, a double burger, and a stack of pancakes. <laughs> a Neapolitan ice cream. All right, thank you. Let me. Yeah, I actually did add a, a couple more things. Number yeah. one, is, <laughs> Susan and I were doing a study about Raya earlier today, and one of the upshots of it in sort of a footnote was that the rabbis of the Talmud were very critical of people who did, were not very pre precise and complete, both brief and complete in their, uh, in their questions and their statements so that they could be not misunderstood. And they, they called people uh, it, it, uh, sometimes in their stories, they'd say that somebody was a Galilean and it meant that they were confusingly imprecise. And then, and my other comment is that for two, two Torah studies in a row, I'm stumbling over dividing up by lot and dividing up proportionally evenly. And I keep wondering, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that? How do they do that? Well, um, but there must be a way somewhere. I, I think it has something to do with calculus, but I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. So let, let me call. I passed, I passed eventually. Jackie and Tom, or you know, <laughs> just Tom. So yeah. I'm getting the lamb ready. Um, this just popped into my, I mean, number one is the Torah speaks to us. I mean, miscommunication, misunderstanding. Today, I think it's worse than it was back then. And but it just popped into my mind. Just remember when that crazy group from Kansas protested in front of the, the temple, and we had pastors and priests and, and imams, and we had a Mormon lady get up on the bima and she says, I'll make you a deal. If you believe half what you hear about me, we'll believe half what we hear about you. <laughs> Good night. I have yeah. one thing to say. Oh, wait. Oh, God, her voice has come back. <laughs> the lamb is spared. I'm going to try to talk. <laughs> uh, on that same vein, um, there's a reason why we have two ears and only one mouth. I use that when I talk to my grandchildren often. It means you're supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. Thank you, Jake. And I'm glad that your one mouth is working well so that our... <laughs> Plural ears can hear your wisdom. Thank you so much. And Marty. We probably don't have enough time to discuss this, but I'll throw this out maybe for people to think about for possibly a future session. Almost any time I look at the Torah, I think about how can we apply this to current circumstances, to yeah. current society? And of course, in many cases, it's just too archaic. You know, it just really doesn't apply. So when you look at uh, the elaborate description of how to handle a murderer, well, we have well-defined laws and we have a whole judicial system that now clearly supersedes that. And, you know, maybe there's some Orthodox people who try to use this, but most people have to adhere to common legal precedents and, 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 and policies. With the instruction about um about marrying for the, within the tribes at that time it made some sense but of course it creates probably real problems with inbreeding and once you no longer know which tribe you're in how do you go about practicing that and would it even be advisable to so i'm always looking for ways in which we can apply this ancient wisdom to our current circumstance but in many cases it doesn't fit well <laughs> I think that goes back a little bit to the issue that Mark Thompson was raising, this, this tension between wanting to carry with us and maintain a continuity with thousands of years uh, of tradition and, and connection and culture 
Uh, and how do we carry that across a river? How do we carry that across the chasm of time? How do we bring that from one epic uh, and era in, into another? So that that's it, it, it's a it's a beautiful. I think Judaism has a beautiful tension uh, that has served us well in terms of this uh, fidelity to, 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 to values and while maintaining a sense of agility in terms of applying those values into specific practices and policies uh, at any given time. <coughs> With that, uh, oh, Mark Levinson, please. No, I just, um, I mean, Marty's comment got me thinking that, you know, how do we apply that that, that situation of, of, of the daughters and their inheritance and, and going forward. And in the context of that time, it was a sense of fairness. So in the context of today, how do we apply fairness to whatever situation arises? I think that's what you've got me thinking about, Mark. Thank you for that. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Mark and, and Marty, for uh, bringing us back to that notion of of fairness, it, it is a rather utopian vision uh, that is presented here where uh, land is to be apportioned according to the size of the tribe and there's supposed to be some kind of accommodation made it, so that the end result is one that seems, as you put it, fair and reasonable. Uh, and and the challenge to us is uh, constantly, yes, what, what does fairness, equity, justice mean at, at any given time? With that, I want to acknowledge that uh, in a sense, while we're, we, especially at this point in time where we're living, uh, David and Susan, thank you. You just, uh, where we're living at this point in time, may very much feel like we're on the edge uh, of who knows which way things are gonna fall in our country and, and in our lives. Uh, in a sense, what Torah is reminding us is that this journey is not merely a historical journey, it's also a spiritual and metaphorical journey. And in a sense, we're always on an edge. We're, we're always having choices uh, to make and how much of the past we carry with us as a source of sustenance and how much we need to innovate because of the exigencies and, and changes of circumstances is always part of the, part of the uh, accommodations that we're, we're making within our lives. What I do know is this, is that it helps to have a community of, uh, of journeyers uh, to rely upon uh, and to be in the midst of uh, to help figure these things out. And I couldn't think of a better company uh, of journeyers than, than all of you. So thank you very much. God bless you all. I look forward to our next gathering, which I want to say next week is going to be led, our discussion is going to be led by Cantor Mark Thompson, who's going to be uh, our, our uh, guest in leading the discussion. So there'll be a special uh, link that will go out for that as well. Thank you very much, uh, Cantor Mark Thompson, for, for leading the group next week. And I look forward to uh, everyone's being well. God bless you all. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so Thank much. You, Rabbi. Thank you. Enjoy your trip.